coming out tonight. I do want to give a little bit of a qualifier about the MLTI parent meeting. As part of our agreement with ML to participate in the MLTI program, which is for all of our 7th and 8th grade, part of the lease agreement that we have is we have to put on a parent meeting each time, each year. And parents, even though they might have been to this previously, also have to come. I say that because my daughter just entered into sixth grade, and in her school, they allow sixth graders to have computers. And my son just entered ninth grade. So my wife and I just got done going to three years of these meetings. And then I had to come to this meeting again, and here I am, the principal of another school, and I still couldn't get out of it, okay? So I hope that might make you feel a little bit better. We work hard to make this night a meaningful night, an important night. There's a lot of information. Students are very excited to get their hands on the laptops to be able to take them home. It's a huge, huge responsibility. One of the things that we've tried to do as a school is also use this opportunity as a learning opportunity for students, but primarily for parents tonight. And each time we try to do that, we try to make sure that we have a speaker to go along with things. And I know, I appreciate everyone coming out. There's been some years where I've done this where we connected it to open house, and it was a long, long night. So what we've done is try to break it up our hope here is tonight that we should hopefully have everybody out uh, between 6.30 and 6.45. Hopefully everyone had a chance to come in and sign in. At the end is when we'll pass out the protection plan forms, and those are your golden tickets. That's what you get for being able to be a good audience. One of the things we did last spring at Westbrook Hill School was we held uh, a family night. And some of you may have come and attended that. It was pretty well attended. It was the first one that we had done. We worked with Westbrook Communities and Care. Our, our school counselors, our student services department put a wonderful program together. And one of the, we had a lot of breakout sessions. And one of the sessions that we had was uh, someone from SARSM who came and talked about internet, cyber harassment, but also just the role of a parent. And the feedback that we got from that was, Matt, that was excellent. That's something we should probably try to get to connect to the laptop parent meeting in the fall. So that's what we were able to be able to do that, so that, because the philosophy really meshes well with our philosophy. Technology can be a great, great thing. It's a powerful thing. But it also can be a dangerous thing. And part of what we want to do tonight is let people know the responsibility that, that uh, we all have in making sure that this positive learning tool doesn't turn into something that can be there and that can backfire and be negative. So uh, the plan is um, we're going to have our guest speaker, and then after that I'll talk about 10 or 15 minutes with some things to go over the protection plan form. We'll pass those out and then uh, we'll be able to go from there. So it's my pleasure to uh, introduce May Emmeline. May uh, is from SARSM, Sexual Assault Response Services of Southern Maine. All right, excellent. And uh, she's got a, a little presentation that she'll do that really focuses on uh, cyber harassment, but more importantly, the role of parents on how we can support our young, our children with these devices. Okay? Great. Thank you so much. So again, my name is May Emline, and I am from an organization called Sexual Assault Response Services of Southern Maine. I'm just going to shorten it to SARS because it's, it's, a bit, it's a mouthful. So um, I'm the education program manager at SARSM, and we do a lot of work with youth talking about digital citizenship um, and cyber harassment. So that's really what I'm going to talk about today. And I'm really going to focus on how all of you as trusted adults can help the youth in your lives navigate social media, technology, and how to use those in really productive ways. 
So the goal for tonight is to give you some concrete action steps that you can follow when you go home tonight. So I'm really hoping that by the end you'll have some resources, you'll have some ways to start a conversation with your children around how to use technology and how to be that good digital citizen. So our time together is pretty brief this evening. So each of you has a handout that looks like this. It has some resources on it and some more information. So I encourage you to take this home, take a look at it. If you have any questions, um, feel free to contact SARSM. And it has some of the resources on it that I'm gonna talk about a little bit later. So just some background on how SARSM approaches the issue of technology. We don't think of the internet or technology or social media as a problem, um, but rather we really want to focus on promoting strategies for helping youth navigate really challenging issues around cyber harassment and then how to help youth become really, really fantastic digital citizens. So while SARSM recognizes that there are predators online, that's not what we want to focus on because if we're thinking about statistics, we know that most of the time harassment happens peer to peer between students who are in the same community or who are in the same school. So that's why I'm spending the majority of my time in this presentation talking about healthy and appropriate behavior online, and then how to, how to get youth to identify and report cyber harassment when they do see it happening, and who the, the adults in their lives to report that to might be. So again, we're not focusing so much on stranger danger, but focusing on skill building for students um, and giving them the resources to report. And a huge part of that is involving parents and everyone in this room in having those conversations with youth about what that might look like. So when we're talking about promoting digital citizenship, what I'm really talking about is the primary prevention model of public health. Um, and so what this means is that the primary prevention, it's about changing social and cultural norms in order to create a safer world, a safer and healthier world for everybody. And that includes everybody in this room. So that's really what we're trying to do. So an example of how this works is when we think about preventing the flu or preventing the common cold, where if we're thinking about preventing it from the very, very beginning, we're thinking about understanding what the causes of the cold or flu are and then preventing those rather than just treating people when they're sick. So we apply the same sort of philosophy to thinking about cyber harassment. And what that means is we're talking about, we're talking and thinking about technology in terms of every single person in a community monitoring their behavior and using technology in really positive ways. So ultimately what it comes down to is teamwork. It requires every single person um, to be good digital citizens. So making sure that you're using technology in positive ways, um, but then also making sure that if somebody is being harassed, you know how to deal with that in, in the right ways. Okay, so just to get things going, we're going to do a raise your smartphone activity. So if everyone can take out their cell phone, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a series of statements. They're also going to be on the board. And I just want you to think to yourself, is this statement true for me? And if the statement is true for you, I want you to just raise your smartphone. And if it's not true for you, you can just keep your hand down. So the first statement is, raise your smartphone if you are connected to Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. All right, that's a lot of the audience. You can put your cell phones down. Okay, the next one is raise your smartphone if you text pictures with your friends. Okay, you can put your phones down. Raise your smartphones if you like to participate in online commenting. Okay. So in this next section, I want you to raise your smartphone if you know someone who has taken and or posted photos or videos meant to embarrass or humiliate someone else. Okay, you can put your phones down. Raise your smartphones if you know someone who has spread rumors or lies through text, posts, chat, or email. Okay. Raise your 
smartphone if you know someone who has participated in some sort of online commenting intended to hurt or embarrass someone else. Okay. And the last one is raise your smartphone if you know someone who has shared a picture or message without that person's permission. All right. Thanks for participating in that. Did anyone notice any themes or notice anything in particular? Okay, well, I noticed a couple things um, as I was watching everyone in the audience raise their smartphones. And so this activity, it tells me a couple of really, really important things. The first is that there are a lot of people in this audience who are using technology in different ways. And it seems like on, probably on a fairly day-to-day -day basis. But then the other thing that I noticed is that there are a lot of people in this audience who know somebody who has used technology in a way that really hurts another individual. And that's what we want to focus on. And actually, those last four statements, such as sharing a, a picture or a message without that person's permission, all of those different statements are actually what we call cyber harassment. And so I'm just going to define that for you so that we're all on the same page and we all know what we mean when we hear that. So cyber harassment is when the internet, cell phones, or other devices are used to post or text um, images, send texts or images that are intended to hurt or embarrass another person. And so this definition comes from the National Crime Prevention Council. Um, so it's not my definition, but what it does tell us is that this is a large enough issue that impacts enough people that someone along the line had to come up with an official definition for it. So when we're, when we're talking about this issue, we're talking about somebody um, choosing to hurt another individual, and they're using the medium of technology, whether that's a cell phone or a social media application or anything else that might be a piece or item of technology. So now that we have a better understanding of what we mean by cyber harassment and what the issue is that we're dealing with, we really want to think about how we can support you, how everyone in this room can be supportive. So when we work with students in our classroom presentations, we have them fill out an evaluation and we ask the question um, about what they think adults can do to help them deal with the issue of cyber harassment or cyber bullying. And so the couple snippets that I'm about to share um, share with you are directly from those evaluations and the direct words of what students have shared with us. So the first one is this. I think a mistake many parents make is to cut off their son slash daughter from the internet. This won't stop the harassment from happening and it certainly won't stop their child from remembering what was said. Adults can help by listening to the kids about their concerns, fears, needs, etc., and use their power to make the student feel safer in their environment. Ask if anyone is having issues. Look out for odd behavior, but never snoop. That will make us, make us kids feel even more targeted. Adults can be aware of their surroundings. Read the kids. If more adults ask sincere questions, we'll be more open. And don't try too hard if someone doesn't want to talk. Some people are private or shy and just don't want to talk, so don't force them. Not pull the so-and-so would never do that. I'm sure they didn't mean it like that. You're probably just overreacting crap. Not assume that technology and social media are the source of the problem and need to be taken away in order to solve it. So those are some of the things that you have told us that they need from adults. So are there any themes that you noticed in these statements? Anything that popped out to you? The second theme that I see in this is that 
being available to offer support is really, really important in that. Sometimes you want adults to use the authority that they have in order to intervene in a situation. The third thing that I see in this is that it's really important to be aware of your surroundings and to stay informed about what youth are engaging with online or what applications they're using or what technology is present in their lives. And the last thing that I see coming from these statements is to believe what is told you, told to you, and to not minimize what someone might be experiencing, um, or to not practice empathy when someone discloses that they're experiencing something online, or maybe they know somebody who is. <laughs> so when we think about these statements, I just want you to keep in mind that we're looking for action steps tonight, and I'm really hoping that some of these statements inform your choices of an action step that you will take when you leave this building when you go home this evening and process some of this information. Okay, so I've thrown a lot of information at you about um, what you feel they need from adults. So I want to give you some resources so that you have some tools under your belt that you can um, help approach these topics and have this conversation. So the first resource that I have to share with you is Common Sense Me, and this is an awesome resource. And I'm gonna pull it up on the internet and we can um, take a look at what it might look like. But Common Sense Media, it explains different applications and it actually rates them. And it does this with all types of media, including movies and TV shows. Um, and so it's a great resource if, you know, your child says, oh, like, I got this new application, or um, kind of alludes to something that they might be seeing or hearing about at school, and you can type in the name of the application, and you can see sort of what is this all about, like what's the intended purpose, um, and see what sort of content it has, and there are other people who have rated this application and can give a review of it. The second application, or second resource, is cyberwise.org. And this has a lot of great resources um, for adults to learn about technology and cyber media. The next one is connectsafely.org, and they have a really fantastic parent's guide to cyberbullying that I would highly recommend. The next one is a platformforgood.org, and it's a web page that reports on all of the positive interactions that are happening online and through social media. And I think this is a really important one because, again, there's a lot of really fantastic and great things that can happen through the use of technology and the media. And so this is just a good reminder that people are using technology and the internet in really, really, really great ways. Um, and again, it goes back to that idea that technology itself isn't the problem, it's how we use it. And the last one, which is not on the board, but is on your worksheet, is 100conversations.org. And it's a website that provides a lot of guidance on where to start having these conversations with your child about digital safety, digital citizenship, and cyber harassment. And it has a lot of other conversation starters for a lot of other really important topics too. So I would encourage you to check that out. So I'm just gonna pull up Common Sense Media and we can take a look at it. Okay, so this is what the website looks like and I'm just gonna do a search for Instagram. sort of reading system that it has. It has a brief description of what parents need to know about this different application, and it will rate certain aspects of it. So for consumerism, it says kids will encounter ads and photos promoting commercial brands as well as sponsored photos or videos. So it gives you some other information about the sorts of things that youth might run into while using this application. more descriptions and one thing that I really like about this is that it gives some potential conversation starters so with Instagram it suggests to check out photography books from the library for kids so if you need to start a conversation about around Instagram it kind of gives you some starting points for that maybe talking about photography and starting that conversation in that way 
It also gives some other application details. Is it any good? Um, and this, so there's a lot of information, and they do this for a lot of the popular applications. Snapchat is on here as well, just to give you some more information if you don't know where to start thinking about an application um, that you're just hearing. as a way to inform yourself, there are just a couple other tips that I want to um, share with you, ways that you can be a trusted adult. So the first one is being open and willing to talk about issues of cyber harassment and social media abuse. And this can be really challenging, but that's where those resources can be really helpful, so that you can use that to inform yourself and then know where to start having these conversations. The second one is don't shame youth culture. Technology is a huge part of youth lives and it's not the cause of harassment. So again, just continually um, reminding yourself that technology is not the problem, it's really the behavior using that technology. The third thing is learn and model active bystander skills, support and help youth to do the same. So when we do classroom presentations, we spend a lot of time talking about how to be a good active bystander and some of the tools that we use to um, get youth to engage and be bystanders is thinking about the three D's. So you can talk with your children and youth about what that means. So what it would look like to intervene in a situation of cyber harassment directly and how to do so in a, in a safe way. Thinking about how somebody could distract in a situation to help somebody who's being harassed or deciding that they can't solve the problem themselves and they need to find somebody who can help them out. So identifying who those people might be and who those trusted adults might be, whether they're at school, whether they're at home. So having conversations about bystander intervention. Modeling respectful behavior in person and online, and then creating a culture of empathy rather than judgment. And then listening and supporting youth that are dealing with cyber and not minimizing their experience um, or the way that it's impacting their lives. So I want you to think about one thing that you can do leaving this room. And I wish we had time for everyone to share what the action step might be, but I really encourage you to think of one thing that you'll do um, with this information, with the handout that I gave you um, when you leave this room to start having these conversations and supporting in dealing with issues of cyber harassment and promoting digital citizenship. So just one last kind of closing comment. If you're concerned about your child and the issue of cyber harassment, start with what they know and what they're seeing and what they're experiencing. Um, and it's always good to begin a conversation with them about this just by figuring out what they know, what language they're using, and maybe they're not using the right the exact definition of cyber harassment, but figuring out what's what they are seeing, what they're hearing, and then talking about it and listening, and then listening some more, and then listening some more. So I'm hoping that this gave you some really useful resources for how to have this conversation, how to promote digital citizenship, and then how to make sure that everyone uses technology in a really productive and healthy way. And I will be here at the end if anyone has any questions or comments, or has any questions about those resources that I made. Excellent job building a culture of empathy and not judgment. How powerful. Something I know that as in a middle school every day that is so, so important to us with that. And also the message of, of, of collaboration and working together. So important. I know as a parent, I struggle with that. Sometimes uh, when we're having challenges with technology, my first instinct is to take it away. Is to take it away when in fact uh, that may not be the best thing that we can do 
you as far as being able to help with that. So very much, thank you very much. Just to let people know, first of all, to shift gears a little bit, um, Angus King, Senator King, was governor when he put the MLTI laptop program into place. And I was fortunate enough uh, to go down to Washington, D.C. Uh, last year and meet uh, Senator King. But I also had an opportunity to meet a lot of principals from around the country. And they're very, very envious about what we've got here in Maine with that, uh, our MLTI program. Because it goes back to 2002, and its original purpose was to pre prepare students for a rapidly changing world. And think about it, just from 2002, how much the world has changed in that time, and so is the way that we interact with our devices. So one of the things that we want to do is help our students to learn to build a positive footprint by the example we set and help them appropriately navigate digital spaces. We talked about di digital citizenship a little bit, and for us, what that means for me is avoiding risky situations. We try to get our uh, students or adults to reflect before they reveal, protect privacy. That digital footprint we talked about, oftentimes there's things right now that people are putting online that are out there forever in terms of your digital footprint. So that's not something that starts when you're adult now, it starts when you have the actual device. We ask people to communicate respectfully, to build community, to do search effectively, because this is a great educational tool that we have, evaluate the credibility of the information that we're getting, and also to respect copyright and avoid plagiarism. So that's something when we talk about digital citizenship that we're looking for. When we give you these devices, all right, they are very powerful, they're also very expensive. So a little care and feeding to take care of them. All right, care and feeding, we gotta take care of the laptop. Some of that is whenever we're carrying it, please make sure we're carrying it in the cases. All the laptops are provided with a case and we ask that people use them. Keep laptops away from food and liquids, okay? Sometimes the damage that we see is oftentimes some spills and it's always an accident. Okay, but oftentimes we want to make sure we're keeping all uh, food and drink and liquids away from the laptops. Use our Google Drive for schoolwork. What a great, important feature we have with the Google Drive that allows so much sharing back and forth from teachers and students. We ask that every night we recharge the computer. When you bring it back in the next day, make sure that we have it charged up. Okay, recharge the computer. Also, it's a beautiful day out there today. Everything is fine. In fact, it might actually be a little too warm in some respects, but the weather's going to change. And when it does, we want to make sure that we're protecting it from extreme weather. It's going to get cold. Let's not leave the laptop out in, the, in the car overnight when it's cold because it impacts. Also, when we use the laptop, we ask that you use it on a flat, stable surface, and we ask that you use it in the public area. What I mean by that is, the damage that we see oftentimes is someone that had it on their lap. And I might be sitting on the couch. I may be sitting in my bedroom on my bed. That's where things happen where damage is caused. We ask that people come back and use that on a flat surface. The Nelson family has some rules where ours are allowed to be used. And that's uh, for many reasons. Uh, but one of them is more the safety of the laptop. When you are finished, Gently close the, the case, okay, the cover. I know there's times sometimes we get rushing, and all of a sudden we kind of slam that a little too hard, and that's where some damage happens. Also, create a unique password for yourself. Students, do not share your password with other students. As parents, I ask that you do know what your parents, what your child's password is. Not so much that you can snoop, that you have the ability to be able to have that over that, okay? We ask that our students do not. It's against the rules to erase your internet history, okay? You can't erase that. And that's something that when we come back, we want to be able to come back in the event that we have to, to see that. If we see something that's erased, then oftentimes that's a signal for us of something that's inappropriate. We talk about teen drama, okay? I stole this from when I went to Gorm the other day, when I, had, when I went through the parent, I came to the parent meeting there. A lot of the drama is still the same. It's just a place.
platform that is a little different. It's changing the font and changing the background color, really. That's from a book called It's Complicated that really focuses on technology. And for that, that's where we're coming back that with these devices, there's not a lot of time and space. As the parents in the room, in our time, when we were back in middle school, there was a lot of drama. There was, but we didn't have it to be time and space. We had the ability for time and space to help with that. That doesn't happen here, but please understand that. And another thing is with great access comes great responsibility. Are devices and apps bad? No, technology devices and apps don't make choices, people do. Technology used appropriately gives a quietness to a voice. What a great, great thing these machines can be. And I already I talked about Common Sense Media as well as being a great resource for a parent. That's something on my laptop that my wife and I, we have bookmarked so that we can come back and be able to stay on top of that. Because there are some sites to be aware of. Some of the self-destructing secret apps like Burn Note, Snapchat, Whisper, uh, main focused on Snapchat on Common Sense Media, but those are some other ones that you can check. We also have some of the more chatting, meeting, dating apps and sites that are also things to stay away from. Okay? And as parents, we want to know that. All right, why we're all here is the protection plan. Okay? And in a few minutes, we're going to pass these out, but I did want to review it. First of all, as a parent, I want to point out to you that it's not required for your student to take the laptop home. This is your choice. You know your child better than anybody. It comes with a huge responsibility, okay? And with that, we want to make sure that everyone is aware. So we have a protection plan. And what does that cover? It covers all damage that is not deemed to be intentional, malicious, or covered under the Apple Care warranty. So if it's something that is not covered under the warranty, the school is going to get a bill. We're going to pass that bill on to you as a parent, okay? But if you have the protection plan, you are all set, okay? The protection plan is what we ask parents to do is you must select to either participate in it or you must choose not to participate in it. In this form today, it has both options. Before students are going to be allowed to take it home, they're going to have to be able to make sure we have this turned in. If you choose to participate in the protection plan, we'll need to have it turned in with payment. If you choose to waive it, that is your choice. But understand that if there is damage to the computer that's not covered by the warranty, that bill will be going to you. Okay? And depending on what it is, it can be pricey. Okay, so that's where that before students can come home, bring home, that's what we have. The protection plan is $50. It covers all damages to the computer. What it does, it includes one repair or one replacement of the LCD screen. It's not unlimited LCD screens. Those suckers are expensive. Okay? Additional repairs or replacements to the LCD screen and lost hardware okay, will be the responsibility of the parents to pay. Now, some of you may have um, other children who are uh, also taking laptops home, and that's really anyone in grade seven through grade seven and eight here at Westbrook Middle School, but all up, also up to the Westbrook High School. If that's the case, the first student costs $50, the second student costs $35. So if that's something, you can just check that off that you qualify for the multi-student discount and that your other child or your children do not attend Westbrook Middle School, just kind of notify that for us um, for it. So that's, um, that's pretty much an overview of what we have for the protection plan. Now, we're going to pass these out tonight. What we ask is, as a parent, you make your decision. Do I want to be in the protection plan, or do I not want to be in the protection plan? You know your child best. If the $50 is something that's difficult, we can set up payment plan options. We have flexibility with that to help people to be able to coordinate through that. What the students need to know is, 
Laptops, the first day that laptops will be able to go home is going to be this coming Monday. Okay? Yeah, that's tough. But part of that is we have to make sure we have the paperwork on them. Okay? The other thing is with these laptops, they are an educational tool and that's what we expect them to be used for. So we can, right now, laptops will not be allowed to go home unless students have this form returned, either where they've taken up above where they choose to participate in the protection plan or down below where they waited. That'll be your choice. We'll work on getting that paperwork in. That'll be organized and once we do, starting Monday, students will be able to take the laptops home. We do not allow laptops to go home on long weekends or school vacations. That's oftentimes the time we're able to do some of our checks for them. That is a privilege that students can get if they do earn a Falcon card. That Falcon card student uh, recipients will be allowed over those long vacations.